Hello, everyone. Um, this is Christine Perret. Thank you for attending the Area Interoperability and Standards webinar today, June 2nd. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to host this webinar on the subject of the Cronus Group and one of the Cronus Group's important specifications for augmented reality, OpenXR. Today's webinar is being recorded. All attendees are in listen-only mode, but there will be an archive. Um, so we invite you to, um, to share the information and uh, if you have um, any questions, to put those into the question panel in your GoToWebinar app. It should be running somewhere on your screen, perhaps on the right-hand side, as it is online. Um, next slide, please. Today's webinar, I'll be just giving you a, a little bit of short overview about our Interoperability and Standards program. Then we'll be hearing from uh, Paul Davies, president of the area and uh, a researcher at the Boeing Company, Neil Trevitt, president of the Kronos Group, and Brent Inskill, who's the uh, OpenXR working group chair and works for Intel. Uh, we have reserved uh, some time at the end for your questions, so please don't hesitate to write those in, and I'll be chairing a panel discussion at the end. Neil, can we go to the next slide? So today we have three experts. They will be introducing themselves at the beginning of their remarks, and um, uh, we'll just want to thank you, gentlemen, for your support of the area and this program. Next slide. So those of you who are um, perhaps unfamiliar with the area, we are an industry association promoting the adoption of augmented reality in enterprise and industrial environments, the workplace more specifically. We have three segments. Um, well, the ecosystem that concerns us has three segments. The enterprises, I like to say, are on the top of the pyramid where they have to uh, not only um, invest, uh, but then perhaps, and um, we're confident, then they can harvest the benefits of introducing augmented reality and implementing it in their, in their workplaces. The providers of technologies and the non-commercial entities support these projects and the, through research and commercial products and services that are ready for enterprise use and integration. Next slide, please. Um, so what we found over the past few years is that integration is um, more difficult than it appears. And approximately one year ago, we started this program focusing on interoperability and standards. Next slide. That is for our members, but also for the ecosystem. And in, in many ways, it reflects some prior work that we had done in the area, working on customer requirements. So we had done workshops and research, identifying the different industries, as well as these, um, this hierarchy of, of um, setting scenarios and use cases. And I don't by any means want to suggest that the small uh, edits or the small text on the right of the boxes are the only industries or the only settings. Those are just samples, uh, examples of the, the, uh, the scope of the schema of needs. And what we found when we get down to the requirements level, if you'll move the advanced one, please, Neil, is that many customers need to integrate um, multiple vendors solutions. That might be because they have new needs that their pre prior vendor didn't cover, or it could be because of multiple companies collaborating or getting acquired by one another. And so they end up having some solutions that are heterogeneous in terms of, um, they're not one sole source proprietary solution. And they want to have uh, a greater ability to uh, build in a modular way. 
Unfortunately, today that's not uh, possible without uh, custom engineering. Another requirement, Neil, if we can move to the next slide, is that the enterprises have existing management systems for their software, for their data, for their users, and they need to bring augmented reality components for visualization into those existing IT systems. So um, those are two different ways in which interoperability and integration um, are necessary and the, uh, the enterprises find those challenging. Next slide. So what we are doing now is uh, having thought leadership content and programs such as this webinar to inform our audiences about uh, interoperability principles in general and then how to reach that interoperability or how to get closer to it. And at the same time, we want to help the standards organizations and other groups, coalitions, associations that want to advance interoperability um, by helping, by providing requirements and feedback. Next slide, please. So we set up some policies and procedures to help us um, guide these different programs. So we are sharing knowledge and supporting the development of standards or existing extensions to existing standards. It's another very important uh, perspective. And when those specifications reach a point where they can be reviewed um, by public audiences and we can give feedback, we also want in the future to conduct events that test interoperability and build um, implementations of these, uh, of these standards or open source projects. Next slide. So those are the ways in which the area is working to help our members and the broader ecosystem uh, get uh, more familiar with spec standards. And I'm here, joined here today by Paul Davies, uh, one of the area members. And Paul, would you please introduce yourself and also talk to us about um, AR and the standards at Boeing, the role of standards in Boeing? Sure, sounds good. Thanks, Christine. Um, so yes, my name is Paul Davies. I am the president of the area currently, and I'm an associate technical fellow at the Boeing company, um, specifically in Boeing Research and Technology. Uh, which is where we do uh, kind of a central, it's a central organization where we develop and uh, research a uh, whole range of technologies for both commercial and uh, defense and our services organization. And my work for over a decade has been focused on augmented reality. And so I've, I've seen a lot of changes in the company, um, you know, in the AR space during that time. And I'm going to kind of reflect on that a little bit. Um, here today. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to address these points a little bit out of order, um, but um, generally my comments probably won't be too surprising, but um, I wanted to share just kind of my perspective from a large company, you know, an OEM that is trying and working to implement um, this technology across the life cycle um, um, and uh, share some of the challenges that we've had and how we think um, uh, uh, standards and interoperability can help. So um, if I start on the interoperability topic, just to kind of follow on from Christine's comments, um, it's very important to a large company in, in a lot of different spaces, but obviously I'm going to focus on the XR space. We have, you know, um, Boeing is a little bit different than some of the companies. We've built a lot of our own solutions um, uh, in XR and beyond, out of XR. Uh, things like um, we've built um, a massive model view, we have our own visualization platform, all homegrown. Um, we've built 3D uh, wiring systems from the ground up, so we have to own and maintain those things. But we'll, obviously, we also rely on vendors a lot, um, uh, like Dassault and Siemens and others, um, for uh, engineering um, uh, uh, data, um, uh, or, or sorry, engineering design. So we need ways to have these systems talk to each other. And these are all kind of pre-XR, these are kind of upstream but these are ultimately going to be the data sources that feed our XR solutions, our AR solutions. Um, so we, we need, um, you know, interoperability is important um, to have standards out there that can, can guarantee that. Um, 
we do have solutions that we're working on that do rely on more than one vendor. And so currently there's a large overhead in doing that, of course, because you know a lot of the vendors are building inside of their own ecosystem, sometimes to their own standards. Uh, some vendors are trying to make you know their um, you know th their way of doing things the standard way of doing things. And when you have multiple vendors trying that, you know then it, you know it, it doesn't really promote um, you know uh, being able to grow quickly in the space. Um, and then of course we need these systems to interface with our IT systems. Um, uh, our MES and ERP um, PLM systems, we, 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 have, we have accomplished this um, by custom development currently, um, which works you know, in a one-off scenario with the exact system that we are you know, trying to interface with, um, but uh, it doesn't scale very well. So uh, interoperability is, is important. Uh, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the standardization across our internal teams as well. Uh, you know, but Boeing again, um, you know, we promote innovation wherever it uh, happens to kind of spawn. Uh, although I'm in BRNT, uh, Boeing Research, um, which is a kind of a you know central organization, we 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 encourage you know other teams wherever you are in the company to innovate and to um, you know to to work on, on on new things. So there are ex there are teams building AR VR solutions uh, across the company. And so right now, these teams are all um, kind of doing their thing in, in a particular area. They pick tools that they like to use. Um, and But these systems at, today would not work together because some people are using you know, one device like a HoloLens and, and other people might be using another device, um, you know, Vive or Magic Leap, um, you know, ML1 or something. And same on the software side, the two main uh, yeah, yeah, Environments are game engines, Unreal and Unity, and of course, there's kind of a kind of a holy battle internally. You know, you've got some teams that are getting more and more embedded in one, some teams more and more embedded in another, and there are others as well. Um, but um, you know, th there is not a lot of standard standardization across our internal work. Um, the problem today is not that bad because this is relatively early still. Um, there aren't that many options out there, especially in the hardware space. Um, you know, I, I could only think of um, three, you know, really maybe four uh, hardware devices that are um, uh, even an option for any kind of realistic, you know, immersive AR experience on, on a head-mounted display. And um, there's a lots of others that are lower level maturity, but we're, if we're talking about putting something to a factory, there's only a couple out there. But this problem will get um, uh, uh, worse or be a bigger problem going forward as more and more things come to market um, you know, if uh, Apple release a, a device, Samsung, other people who have not done so yet, um, this, this, will, this problem will get worse if we don't solve it. Um, so kind of leading off, to, off from that, um, it's always our goal to not rely on a particular vendor or, um, or, or um, you know, or solution uh, as, as much as we can. Um, and especially in a space like this, where there's a lot of R&D going on and it's very fast changing. Um, companies come and go, as we've all seen. I think last year there was a, a, a slew of smaller uh, AR companies who left the, you know, left the uh, arena. And there's new ones coming in every day, and so it's very difficult for us to pick one and lock ourselves into it. Now, with large companies like Microsoft, it's less of an issue, uh, but um, you know, uh, we still want to build things that are not um, completely reliant on, on, one, on, on one vendor. And one of the reasons for that is supportability. Uh, obviously, we, you know, Boeing, we don't build the hardware, the XR hardware, but we do need support from it. So if we are going to spend money and, in, you know, invest um, building a system that, you know, it goes into our factory or maybe, uh, you know, we offer as a service to one of our customers, uh, we're going to need long-term support for that, um, uh, you know, device uh, replacement uh, or whatever the case is. There's lots of elements to the support. Um, and, and that's internally also. Um, uh, we have our own internal help desk, and we've, you know, if, if we're going to invest, you know, time and, and effort to to build a, um, you know, an internal support solution for a particular um, uh, uh, piece of technology we've built, we want it to last. We want it to be around for for a long time. And then finally, that kind of leads me on to um, what what is actually the first bullet here, but is going to be my last um, last comment, and that's about future proofing of what we're working on. Um, for all the reasons I've already mentioned, that there's, there's, there's actually one other very important reason. Um, there's uh, in the air, aircraft space, you know, highly regulated industry, there is um, the requirement 
to be able to retain access to the digital data that might be used to build a particular aircraft for the life of that aircraft. Uh, so if, if, if we put a XR device on a mechanic and he uses a, a scene or an experience to build, um, you know, install a wire, whatever, to perform an operation, the digital data that he accessed, in this case, a you know, an XR experience, a lightweight geometry, needs to be accessible for the life of the aircraft. Now that can be 30 years plus, uh, you know, some of them can be 50 years. And so if we are using non-standard, you know, proprietary formats and experiences, you know, it's very difficult to guarantee that they will still be accessible in 50 years. Um, it, uh, a lot of this, uh, we get we get past a lot of this, or we solve a lot of a lot of this with PDF documents. Those are, um, you know, uh, future proof. They've been around for a long time, and they'll be around for a long time going forward. They're a standard. We don't have the similar um, uh, standard available for XR scenes and and uh, experiences. So, um, you know, we use we use uh, FBX files a lot. Um, you know, those are proprietary to Autodesk. So, um, you know, we don't know. You know, in 50 years, it's a difficult thing to predict. So we're very interested in in, in interoperability and standards for, for that reason as well. So I hope that helps a little bit to set the stage and provide a little context from you know from a large OEM manufacturer. Um, so back back to you, Christine. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. That's perfect. Um, Neil, I think it's over to you to explain more about the Kronos Group and um, how you see the world how you're helping this solve some of these problems. Sure, thank you, Christine. And that was a very interesting poll. The, um, so yeah, hi everyone, I'm, I'm Neil Trevitt. I, I work on developer ecosystems at NVIDIA and I'm uh, president of the Kronos Group. And as Christine says, I'm here to give a brief introduction to the family of Kronos open standards that are being used for building virtual and augmented reality, or we call it XR uh, experiences and how they work together and also how the Kronos standards work with the larger constellation of standards throughout the industry to enable XR uh, developers uh, before Brent dives into more detail onto OpenXR uh, itself. So firstly, I guess what is an open standard? As um, Paul was just saying, most industry standards are interoperability standards that define how two entities, it can be two devices or perhaps hardware and software, interoperate. Uh, all industries rely on open standards to reduce costs, grow markets, removing needless friction to widespread deployment of technologies. Uh, a true open standard is not controlled by any one company and are free for anyone to use. And widespread deployment of XR is going to take hundreds of standards from many different standards organizations, some of which are shown here on the slide. Um, and each of those standards organizations has its own area of focus, uh, including Kronos. So, so what is Kronos's focus? Uh, we are an open standards organization. Um, we create interoperability standards to enable software applications and engines to access the power of hardware and silicon acceleration for domains such as 3D graphics, virtual and, and augmented reality and parallel computation. Uh, we are a non-profit and all the standards we create are open and royalty free for the industry to use. We've been doing this for around 20 years now and have 160 members, everyone from NVIDIA and Intel all the way down to small startup companies uh, all around uh, the world. And we are open to any company who wishes to join and have a voice and a vote in how these uh, standards evolve. So here are some of the kernel standards that I think are most relevant to XR in particular. There are four main groups. Firstly, on the right-hand side, rendering APIs uh, for 3D, including WebGL and Vulkan. Uh, the OpenXR API standard, which we'll go into a lot more detail on for portable access to augmented and virtual reality devices. At the top, there's initiatives concerning 3D asset formats, including GLTF. And I'm gonna mention briefly the new 3D commerce working group. And lastly, on the left-hand side, we won't have time to cover the today, but languages for parallel computation. It's relevant to AR because they're increasingly being used for vision processing and inferencing. The main focus for today, though, is OpenXR. And as Brent's going to explain, now OpenXR contains everything an application needs to drive the XR devices in a system. That's discovering the devices, the event processing, sensor tracking, post calculations on the input side, and frame display timing, composition, and haptics control on the output side. But I'll leave that for Brent to go into. But the one thing that OpenXR doesn't have is 3D rendering. So you use OpenXR 
together with a rendering API, such as Vulkan, to actually generate the augmentations in the imagery. OpenXR can be used with any 3D API, uh, but a new generation API like Vulkan is particularly well suited because it has low latency and high rendering performance, which is, of course, you know, vital for a good, uh, compelling XR experience. Vulkan and OpenXR are both native APIs, but I'm a firm believer, and I think Christine is too, that the metaverse of openly connected and searchable virtual spaces and interstitial experiences is likely to evolve out of the world wide web. And so it's critical that the industry bring XR capability uh, to the browser. The good news is that Kronos and the W3C, that's the World Wide Web Consortium, are cooperating to bring 3D and XR capability into the web stack. All 3D in the browser, 3D in the browser today uses WebGL. That's a Kronos standard that defines a JavaScript binding over native 3D APIs and is used by popular 3D web engines such as 3.js and Babylon. Now we also have the OpenXR native API exposing XR hardware capabilities. And Kronos is working closely with the WebXR working group at W3C to bring that capability into the browser. So just as native XR apps can use Vulkan and OpenXR together, XR apps in the web can use WebGL and WebXR together, with the Web APIs reaching down into the Kronos native APIs for both acceleration and hardware portability. As well as providing application portability across different HMD devices, OpenXR will also provide portability as AR is deployed on new platform architectures, such as edge servers. One architecture being developed uses 5G, for example, to connect a lightweight AR device to send its real-time sensor data to an edge server that processes that sensor data, maybe using inferencing and generates graphical augmentations that can be much more sophisticated than could be generated on a battery-powered device and are sent back wire wirelessly to the device for display. The OpenXR API can hide these round trips over 5G from the application, enabling the same A AR application to run natively on an AR device or an AR device connected to an edge server. And as that last slide showed, every XR application in the end needs to access and display 3D scenes and objects. And as the Kronos GLTF 3D asset format, uh, that's the solution, we think, as it's focused on being ubiquitous, compact, and easy to use. And so we like to call it the JPEG of 3D. It's the last mile JPEG equivalent that lets you easily transport and deploy and use your 3D assets wherever you need. Uh, GLTF uses JSON to de describe the 3D scene or asset hierarchy and uses binary payloads to describe the data-heavy geometry, animations, and skins. Textures are typically included as JPEG or PNG files. The latest version of GLTF, which is GLTF2, has PBR or physically based rendering that lets textures describe how metallic or rough materials are or how specular and glossy. This results in very realistic looking objects that can still be rendered very efficiently even on mobile devices and even in a PowerPoint presentation as we are seeing here. That is a, a standard GLTF um, uh, asset being rotated right there. Support for GLTF is now uh, widespread throughout the industry. Oops, sorry. As companies realize the, fish, the efficiency and the cost savings of having tools, apps, and engines that can all communicate assets easily to each other, the companies shown here have all implemented GLTF, both in tools that generate GLTF assets and engines and applications that ingest those GLTF models. So if your company supports GLTF and your logo isn't here, please let us know. We will be delighted to add it. And lastly, the need to create and deploy 3D assets at industrial scale uh, for 3D commerce, which often uses mobile and web-based XR platforms, has prompted a number of retail companies such as IKEA, Amazon, and Target to approach Kronos as a 3D savvy safe space to enable cooperation on creating guidelines and standards for creating and configuring 3D assets and ensuring they can be faithfully displayed on a wide range of end user devices. 
this, this new 3D Commerce Working Group is leveraging GLTF and is inspiring GLTS evolution, including GLTS new generation PBR model to accurately, accurately display a much wider range of products. Streamlining the creation and deployment of 3D assets at scale is not only going to enable 3D commerce, but will have a profound and positive impact on deploying all types of XR applications and solutions. And to Paul's point, uh, Kronos is now actually working with ISO to bring GLTF and this uh, scalable asset creation and usage into the PDF uh, format for longer term archi archival uh, uh, reasons. So uh, that's that's the end of my presentation. I hope it gives you an introduction to Kronos and sets the context for more details on OpenXR that are just coming up. If any of these Kronos standards are relevant to your business, any company is welcome to join Kronos to have a voice and a vote in their evolution. Uh, annual memberships start at just three and a half thousand dollars for smaller companies. So thank you for your time. And now let me hand over to Brent for more details on OpenXR. Okay, thanks, Neil. Appreciate that. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Brent Insko, and I'm lead VR and AR architect at Intel, and I'm the working group chair for OpenXR. So I'll talk a bit about uh, what OpenXR is and uh, why it was needed to have yet another standard and where we are with it today. Since we only have about 25 or 30 minutes, it will be a very high level talk. I'll point to some additional resources uh, that you can get more information on uh, if uh, you are interested. Let me go to the next one. So talk about what it is, how we kind of got started, uh, what the things are we're trying to solve, give you a bit of timeline on where we are with things, uh, a very high level overview, and then talk about what's next. So OpenXR is a royalty-free open standard that provides a high performance access to augmented and virtual reality platforms and devices. And as Neil said, Kronos concentrates on uh, interface, generally concentrates on interfaces between the software and the silicon. And so, okay, great, this is a, you know, a nice definition. So what does it really mean and how did we get there? So among the first widely available platforms in this latest wave of AR and VR were the, the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive. And this is great. We had you know this the start of this new VR ecosystem. We had multiple platforms out there available for consumers, and they had options on what you could buy. Uh, but you know, you have this interesting hardware, but you need to be able to do something with it. And these platforms required applications and the challenge for developers that each of these platforms had different software development kits. And if you think about it though, at the core for VR and for AR that matter, there's there are really common tasks that you want to get and, and perform with these platforms, right? Like get my current position in the world, get the curtain, current buttons that are pressed on the controller, tell me where the image I am drawing needs to appear on the display. These are all common requirements for AR and VR. And so right off the bat, you ha already have a fragmented ecosystem, right? And this causes problems for a number of reasons. One, it increases development time and cost. It increases validation time because if you're developing an application, you have to run it on the multiple, multiple different platforms and that increases cost. And it also just, you know, the time that's used also reduces the amount of time a developer can spend on developing new titles and new features. And so, and this is just a couple of, of platforms right at the beginning of, uh, of the start. And so, you know, this was a snapshot a little while ago, you start having all of these different platforms with all of these different SDKs. And if you're an, an application developer, or you're trying to ensure that your application is going to work on the one that's going to win in the end, you have a lot of different platforms to choose from, including the Quest and uh, ML1 and, and others that aren't even listed on here. And so developing a single application to serve all of these runtimes, all of these devices, all of these platforms becomes a very big uh, challenge. And so recognizing this problem, several companies got together in late 2016, early 2017 and formed OpenXR Working Group. And it really is meant to work towards 
uh, solving the problem for virtual reality and augmented reality as well. Hence the inclusion of uh, the V and the A in our logo. And so to understand the problem more visually, we made this diagram. It, it shows you know, the current AR and VR markets are still relatively small. So developers need to reach as large an audience as possible, meaning they must try to support as many of these platforms as possible. And in this diagram, you have a group of applications that either talk through game engines, have developed their own engine or own application rendering engine, and potentially even talk directly to the vendor runtimes. And each of these vendor specific paths are frustratingly different from each other. Um, you know, game engines can hide some of these differences, but even they and the developers that end up using them can benefit from all of the runtimes using a common set of interfaces. And so what OpenXR seeks to do is to unify and create a single common API and a single common device interface, uh, going from the mess of this specialized support for each platform to a single path support across all platforms. So taking a, a one step closer view of a typical you know, AR, XR, VR software stack, uh, you typically have an application that talks directly or through a game engine, or as Neil said, if, we, if, if all is run through the web, you, you talk through WebXR through a browser. Uh, these talk directly to the graphics and other system APIs, and it also talks to a VR runtime. And this runtime is supplied by the VR platform vendor. And this runtime is responsible for things like handling the tracking, composing the final image for display, and handling controller input, or detecting hands and tracking you know, uh, users' actual hands. So subsequently, the VR runtime then talks to this VR hardware to get the raw information, such as the tracking coordinates and button presses. And the red interfaces that are highlighted are the VR APIs or the AR APIs. And this is what OpenXR seeks to standardize across the various platforms. And so showing the flow of diagram to and from an application through the whole XR system, you can see through the OpenXR API, the runtime would send things like the controller state, pose information, input events to the application, and in return, the application sends the pre-distorted images to display uh, and information about haptic output that needs to be generated on the controllers back into the runtime. And then through the device plugin extension, the vendor hardware would be able to send the controller state and raw pose information to the runtime, and the runtime would send post-distorted images and haptic information onto the hardware. And it's important to note that OpenXR is not replacing the runtimes for the platforms. Each vendor, be it Valve or Oculus or Microsoft with HoloLens, they're all going to supply their own runtimes. What we are doing is making a standard so that these runtimes can expose their features via a cross-platform API. Uh, let me jump over this one. This shows just uh, there are multiple ways that runtimes can be structured based on the uh, underlying hardware, but we uh, we don't have to go into that. Uh, so in the beginning work on OpenXR, we developed a number of philosophies to guide our, our work. And so we really wanted to focus on enabling both VR and AR applications. Uh, we wanted to streamline the software and hardware development for, across a wide variety of platforms. We also wanted to be future-proof because as Paul was saying, you never know what's coming in the future and you don't want to block off innovation. And so we're focused on enabling the current state of the art, but we did want to build a flexible architecture and enable in extensibility to support rapid innovation in both software and hardware as we go forward. Uh, we also did not want to try to predict the future, particularly in XR technology. We tend to be very bad at it. So we wanted to use forward-looking API design techniques to enable engineers to easily express what the new hardware capabilities would do and to be able to test out new and emerging technologies. And fourth, we wanted to unify performance critical concepts in XR application development so that the developers can optimize to a single predictable target rather than adding complexity to handle a variety of different target platforms. Because obviously to have a great user experience in XR, it requires extremely low latency and, and high performance uh, uh, 
processing. So where are we on the timeline? So as I mentioned, we started in uh, late uh, late 2016, early 2017. We formed the, the working group, uh, defined what we wanted to deliver for uh, our uh, 1.0. And through a series of releases, we actually uh, were able to release a specification uh, last year at SIGGRAPH uh, in July. And so uh, it's out there, you can check it out. It's openxr.org or go to the Kronos website for OpenXR. Um, right now, what we're doing is we're in the process of developing the conformance tests and, and developing the adopters program. And, uh, a really important and oft neglected part of the standardization effort is around developing conformance tests because it's great to have a specification, but if you don't have the tests to enforce that the platforms actually adhere to it, then it doesn't do any any good, right? Uh, you, if you develop your application on one particular platform, you want to have confidence that it will work on all the others that state that they have performance. And that can happen both ways, right? The one you develop on might have differences from the underlying specification or the one that you want to deploy to but don't have in-house to test on potentially has diff differences as well. So having a, a thorough conformance suite is, is, is vital in the health of a specification. So I'm just going to hit, as I mentioned, there's not enough time to do a real deep dive into many of the concepts in OpenXR, so I'll just touch on four. And I encourage those who are interested to go check out last year's SIGGRAPH presentation for a few of the more, uh, get a bit more detail. So this is uh, the OpenXR application flow diagram. So I, as I mentioned, won't go into too much detail, but essentially you, uh, you start up and grab an instance, which is, essentially establishes a connection to the underlying underlying ARVR platform. You start up a session, which means you're ready to start using the platform and rendering to it. And then you actually enter the frame loop where you're actually generating frames and those are getting displayed out to uh, the display hardware. Uh, at the moment, we currently support uh, two form factors. Uh, we really tried to keep the the breadth of what we were trying to support narrow so we could get the 1.0 specification out there. So we do support things like camera pass through AR through a, like kind of a monocular display or your handheld. And we also obviously support head mounted displays uh, such as uh, the Vive, the Index, the Rift and the HoloLens and Magic Leap One. Uh, we do have thoughts about the future about potentially supporting cave-like environments uh, from a VR perspective as well. Uh, similarly, we have mono and stereo. So if you're doing the holding up your phone and looking around, we support that. And we also support the, uh, the stereo views as well. Uh, one area I want to spend a little bit of time on uh, that we gave a lot of thought about is around input and haptics. Um, and basically, you know, what we want to be able to do is, um, you know, support, uh, you know, a user clicks a button and it results in the, the user teleporting, let's say for, for VR. Um, and what we were wanting to do is make, abstract that away so that it could be supported across a wide variety of platforms. And so the goal of the next few slides is just to talk about how this actually works. Um, so OpenXR, it goes, input goes through a layer of abstraction built around actions. And these allow application developers to define input based on the resulting action. Like if you wanna grab something, if you wanna jump, if you wanna teleport, rather than explicit binding controls such as button A means grab. Uh, and these actions represent the actions that the game or the application is interested in, but not details about how the input is actually done. Uh, and instead, the application explicitly codes that the pressing the A button, uh, instead of doing that and saying that that's a teleport, it registers a teleport action separately from the bindings of the controllers. And so, the application can suggest certain bindings for certain controllers like, oh, on the Rift, I want A to do jump, but it's up to the underlying runtime to control that. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons why you want to be able to do that. Um, and we do this through uh, the, the notion of an interaction profile where you would have a collection of input and output sources on physical devices. So you'd have uh, let's say for a particular platform that has fancy controllers, you'd have a left hand and a right hand, and each of the controllers would have a variety of types of input, right? You could click an A button, 
you could trigger, uh, you could also produce uh, haptic output to that controller. Um, and we have a variety of predefined uh, interaction profiles for a variety of controllers that already exist out there. And the reason that you do this is you want to be able to give the user the ability to remap controls, right? Maybe they want to make the B button jump or something. You also want to future-proof your applications going forward because there's any number of types of input devices that could be designed into the future. Uh, it's also a, um, uh, a way to enable accessibility uh, controllers as well for those who, who need that, right? So that you could remap the buttons into other types of controls that allow more people to uh, take advantage of the uh, of the controls. And so essentially our, as as Paul was alluding to, right, the these applications, you want to work on a number of platforms, you want to work on the future, and you never know, like 50 years would be a really long time to, to think about. Um, and our our motto was, you know, the dev teams are ephemeral, but uh, are ephemeral, but games and applications last forever, ever, right? And so, um, as new platforms get developed, uh, you want the games that have existed before to be able to work on those new platforms. Um, and so, you want to be able to uh, take that application and remap those inputs that were built for some controller 10 years ago into the controllers that exist today. jump on through. So that's probably enough about input. Uh, frame timing, I, I just wanted to throw this out here. We also, it's a, it, this is a very simplistic representation of a, of a more complex threaded pipeline. I just wanted to throw this out there. And we spent a lot of time thinking about how OpenXR would work with multi-threaded game engines, trying to make sure that we're utilizing the capabilities of the underlying platform to their utmost and that OpenXR doesn't get in the way of uh, high high performance, low latency systems. Um, so, if you want to, you want some more details about this. Nick Whiting uh, from Epic uh, had a talk about uh, at GDC a couple of years ago. Just just know that we gave a lot of thought to how you go about rendering frames, getting the timing, making sure that you're rendering the frame just in time so that you're getting the latest update on the display for your VR or AR system. Um, so that's what I'll talk about in terms of where we are with the the core API. I do want to talk a little bit uh, backing up in terms of like how Kronos works. Um, you know, Kronos develops kind of a core standard uh, that you build around, and the and these are like the fundamental. This is the fundamental specification for support. And for us, it means like instance management. It means tracking. It means frame timing. It means controllers and and input. And then as uh, you develop and you move forward, there's this notion of KHR extensions or Kronos level extensions. And the, this, this encompasses functionality that a large class of runtimes will support, but maybe not all of them, right? So it allows multiple vendors to get together and innovate in, in, as, uh, in a safe space, uh, if you will, um, so that they can still expose the features of their underlying hardware, but maybe not something that every single platform uh, will support. And maybe there are things that are specific to VR that aren't specific, that, that don't work in AR, something like that. Um, there's a notion of EXT extensions where there's a few runtimes that might support them. And then there's vendor extensions where, hey, our platform has these really unique features. We want to, in general, support the, the core standard, but there's some you know, really cool features we also want to enable in applications as well. And this enables the uh, vendors to expose those. And so as we were developing the core specification, we also developed a number of, of these extensions that will be supported by a number of different platforms. Uh, one of the challenges around uh, standardization is, is OS support, right? There are a number of, of challenges around making something that works across Android and Windows and Linux and other types of OSs. Um, so there are certain things we have to do, for instance, on the Android platform that are specific. So we have some, some support there. Uh, as Neil said, we work with all of the different graphics APIs. And so we have, um, but not every platform may support every API, graphics API. We, we really tried to build OpenXR that is um, graphics API agnostic. So 
your application doesn't need to know what the the OpenXR application doesn't need to know what the underlying graphics API is, uh, but we do support all of the different ones that are out there. Uh, we also have some different types of composition layers um, and some other things related to time that that, that aren't very specific, but but more relevant to say AR and VR platforms. Um, and to show that we are making forward progress, as I mentioned, uh, we released the 1.0 specification in July. Over the, the last few months, not only have we we've been working to button up the conformance suite, we also look at pushing the API forward. And so, uh, a couple of months ago, we released an, an eye tracking extension. I think we, we officially called the eye gaze interaction uh, extension. And this is really about the devices that allow you to get the uh, eye information and track eye tracking information and what the uh, user is looking at and it allows things like foveated rendering to allow more optimal rendering, uh, gaze selection, feedback and aiming, and also social interaction if you want the avatars to actually look in the direction that the user is looking. It also gives some head, headset position guidance where as you're trying to mount the head on the, the headset on a person, making sure it's aligned and, and, and giving the user feedback is, is important as well. And literally on Friday, we released a hand tracking extension, and this represents about eight months worth worth of work across a number of different uh, companies uh, that we're trying to standardize around how do you do hand tracking? What are the types of joints? What do you name them? How do you provide that input into um, the system that is common across hardware that already exists, right? We're developing this across this API uh, across hardware that already exists. We're not trying to define a standard and then build hardware to it, right? And so getting uh, all of these different companies that have all of these different features in the underlying platforms is a real challenge, but we, we've, we've come up with how do you provide that input back to the application in a common way? And so, like I said, that, that literally got into the spec on Friday is, and is currently published out, out on uh, our website. Um, so not only do we do development through extensions, that's generally the way we push forward. There are a lot of things that we're thinking about from a 1.1 uh, pers perspective. You know, we're always pushing forward. Um, I'm not going to go through the list. There, there are certain things. And there's also, you know, this is the first iteration of this specification, right? We're, we just released 1.0. So there are a number of things we want to go back. And, and as we get more experience with the specification, we are like, oh, well, we should have done it this way or this way will be better. So we're always evolving, we're always improving. Um, but uh, I'll provide a, a number of ways to uh, to provide feedback to us about things that you would like to see. Uh, there's a number of, and obviously joining Kronos is always a, a good method for it as well if you want to participate. Uh, so as I mentioned, yeah, we released 1.0 and they're making forward progress in, on getting the conformance suite put together. We've gotten a lot of industry support, which is great. We have um, support across all the major vendors, uh, AR and VR vendors, um, and we're still working on um, uh, evolving things going forward. So uh, really quickly, what resources do we have available? Uh, so we have a 200 plus, oops, sorry. I am not advancing. Uh, sorry, uh, let me show the hand tracking extension there really quick. Uh, and sorry, it wasn't advancing there. So what resources are available? So we have a 200 plus page uh, specification. Uh, we also have reference pages so that as people get, um, if you wanna know exactly what a particular function does, uh, you can look up uh, based on functionality. And we also have had this overview guide, which I had uh, grabbed the, uh, the API overview from. Uh, we have uh, three GitHub uh, repositories. Uh, we have one around the documentation. We have uh, the registry, which uh, lists the specification and the extensions as we develop those. Uh, we also have an SDK where you can um, find out more information about the loader, which is kind of how you get access to the um, uh, the underlying API uh, on the platform that you're using. There's some basic API layers, which I didn't go into de detail. And then we also have some sample applications that you can uh, test out, such as uh, Hello XR. Um, 
It also contains the generated files. You can build on Windows as Linux, and you can embed these uh, these files into the projects as, as you develop them. So we have a number of primary resources. So we have the main OpenXR landing page um, uh, at chronos.org. We have uh, a forum, and we have a Slack channel. We have a number of preview implementations out there as we're working. As I mentioned, we don't have the full conformance we've developed yet, but a number of companies have uh, implementations that you, you can test out. Uh, Collabora has an open source implementation they've been developing called Monado. Microsoft has the OpenXR runtime for Windows Mixed Reality Set. They also have uh, work that you can uh, test out on the HoloLens. Oculus has released their prototype OpenXR implementation for the Rift. And Epic has incorporated OpenXR uh, 1.0 plugin into the 4.24 release of their engine. And we also have SIGGRAPH sessions uh, you can uh, find videos on. We have a number of other uh, resources uh, from a number of vendors and other places on the web you can go check out. Uh, what's next? Let me skip over that. Uh, I also want to talk about we are also seeing you know, open source adoption. As, as Neil said, the web may be the way we have uh, AR and VR uh, really take over the world. And so we've, uh, the Chromium project has incorporated OpenXR and the default uh, mechanism for AR and VR support for WebXR in Chromium is through OpenXR. So both the Google Chrome and the Microsoft Edge browsers use OpenXR natively. And then coming up in the next few weeks, uh, Blender's latest uh, release uh, 2.83 will support OpenXR and uh, through OpenXR support native uh, VR uh, rendering as well. And it's, this is the open source 3D creation suite. Uh, many thanks, there's a bunch of companies that have been involved from the beginning and, and joined throughout. Uh, so I wanna just thank those uh, companies and, and the engineers who have helped uh, get that out there. So uh, with that, uh, I think we're uh, approaching the Q&A time. I just wanna talk about how OpenXR is really a win-win-win for all involved, right? It's a win for the vendors because uh, they can bring more applications onto their platform by leveraging the OpenXR uh, content ecosystem end users, they don't have to be locked into a piece of hardware and have to decide, well, I wanna buy this one because I want particular content. They can choose with confidence on which platform, knowing that if it's developed on OpenXR, it will work on multiple platforms. And for the ISVs, it can they can more easily ship on more platforms for uh, reaching a, a larger market. And, and Neil already hit the slide, so I won't talk about Vulkan. Um, before we go, please let us know about things in the in the spec you'd like to see, uh, and obviously get more involved if if standards uh, are important to you and you want to have a direct impact on where we go with it. So, thanks. And Christine, I turn it back over to you. I'll jump onto the oh the cube rotation slide to the speaker <laughs> slide. <laughs> Thank you, Brent. That's perfect. Um, really, really interesting and. Um, Kudos to everybody that's been working so hard on this. I, I know um, there are, as you said, many, many people and um, it's a very active working group. Um, we could spend hours, but we don't have that time. Um, I have a couple of questions that I'd like to, um, to shoot at you. You know, I'm gonna start off with one, um, Brent, because you just, um, uh, mentioned that uh, you know, you're working on 1.1, of course, but you already have the first version a year ago. Um, is there anything you would have done differently if you if you could could go back? Could sure. you, which, the things you've done differently for 1.0? So uh, one area, we, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation that we spent a long time on was around frame timing. And one of the, the challenges is we were trying to supply and support a number of different platforms out there. And so looking back, we may have uh, made it more flexible uh, than, than, I wouldn't say the necessary, but 
Um, as we start diving, as we've started diving into it, I, I think there are some things we would go back and say, well, if we had this piece of information, it would make uh, application debug much easier or understanding mm -hmm. what happened on this platform, uh, you know, more easy to figure out what happened. And so, you know, you always are trying to develop something that, that um, not only is standard across platforms, but you also want to make it easy for people to understand what's underlying going on in, in the platform. And I think we left things a little loose. So one of the things we're looking at one on one is is tightening up some of the frame loop timing information we can provide back to the application. So when they have a performance issue and they're not hitting, you know, the 11 milliseconds they have to render at 90 hertz or something, they understand, oh, this is what happened and this is what I need to do to tweak the application. So that's that's one of the areas I think we could, uh, and we're looking at uh, changing as we go forward. And uh, the other piece is we didn't get the develop, the, um, sorry, the, the device interface layer done um, in terms of like simplifying and, and easing or simplifying the layer between the run times and the application or, mm -hmm. and the hardware, sorry. And one of the things we were thinking about is could you plug an Oculus into a Steam VR uh, plug uh, runtime or a Microsoft Windows MR experience, right? That that level of device interface. And it was it was really like we had to cut things to get a 1.0 out there and we really felt the application level fragmentation was the major problem we wanted to solve. And, and um, now whether that'll come in 1.1 or sometime later, that's that's to be seen, but uh, that was one of the things we cut as well. Well, in fact, um, you know, there was a, I, I don't know if their logo was on the screen when you showed the, different companies that were participating in this, but there are a number of questions about iOS support and how or if Apple is involved so that this fragmentation um, doesn't persist at, at, at some time in the future when we have Apple glasses. Right. Um, so I would say Apple is a member of Kronos. Uh, they are have not been participating in the the OpenXR uh, development, um, but I will say that Google was one of the early uh, companies that had been developing uh, OpenXR and pushing uh, on um, making it work across, as I mentioned, Android platforms as well. And it was something you know early on with Daydream in particular um, they were looking at. Um, I think it, uh, I, I can't speak for member companies and what their, their support mm -hmm. plans are, but, uh, but they have definitely been, been participating and have participated in, in OpenXR development. Right. Okay. So another question, some, somewhat related, but because it's around Apple and, and iOS, um, this is for Neil, uh, GLTF is definitely out there and very, very widely implemented, but it, there are still questions about um, USDZ and what about, you know, what do content creators need to do at that level? So this is a Kronos group level question instead of just open XR, but it does apply to XR too, if we have GLTF involved. Yeah, that's right. And it's, it's interesting, uh, you've juxtaposed it with that previous question too. I think that in the larger um, picture, I mean, that there are some companies uh, out there, including Apple, that like to have control over their own vertical stacks. And, and of course, that is their uh, prerogative, but it does create issues for developers and other third parties that are trying to not be locked into a particular vendor uh, platform. So, there are many things that Kronos is doing uh, across many of the working groups that are trying to find ways of bridging into uh, walled garden ecosystems, and, uh, such as Apple's, for example. I mean, the, there's um, on the 3D rendering API side, you no know, Vulkan uh, is not allowed to ship on Apple platforms, and you know, they have their own Metal API, but we have done layering. Uh, implementations of Vulkan that run on top of Metal, so you mm -hmm. can take your Vulkan applications onto a Metal platform. GLTF is, is another interesting example the, where Apple have, um, again, created their own proprietary 3D asset format, um, and you know, the rest of the industry has adopted uh, GLTF. I think the, the way I'm seeing that work out is 
because GLTF is an open standard that is not under, under the control of any one company, all of the tool chains are likely to be built around uh, GLTF, that ecosystem diagram I showed, you know, has literally hundreds mm -hmm. of companies uh, investing in the GLTF ecosystem. And then doing a last minute hop over into deployment into uh, any walled garden proprietary ecosystem. So your non-standard based last 100, 100 yards, not the last mile, the last 100 yards is, is, is minimized as far as possible. And even Apple is doing uh, something like that. Now they now have an importer for GLTF files into their USDZ based uh, ecosystem. So I think this kind of bridging and layering is kind of the new thing to uh, mm -hmm. enable developers to not you know, suffer too badly from fragmentation, even when platforms are kind of do, doing their own thing. It'll be interesting to see, you now of course, Apple are not shipping uh, XR right now, but if they do, you know, maybe maybe you know, we'll, we'll see this similar layering kind of uh, solutions for OpenXR. That's uh, just a total brainstorm. Uh, we, we don't know what's gonna happen, but it, it is a possibility. Fantastic. We don't have time for any more questions. There's um, certainly a lot more to learn and also for area members in the ecosystem to support OpenXR um, as it as it uh, matures. And as, um, so thank you very much, gentlemen, for your participation and contributions. Thank you to attendees, your questions, and that's a wrap. Great. Thank you, Christine. Yep. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.